So thank you everyone for being so punctual. My name is Mike Miles and I'll be moderating this session. I have a number of very short announcements. Uh, there is, through the generosity of Kim Hyatt, we have a soiree or a, a get together, social gathering at the university club tonight. Uh, a number of people were pre-invited to this uh, event, uh, but we now have extra tickets available. So at the, uh, at the next coffee break, if, you, if you're interested in coming, uh, there will be tickets available. Uh, this will run between 5.30 and 7.30. It's, there's no cost, and uh, Kim has organized really nice spread of uh, liquor and good food uh, with the idea of uh, facilitating some, some, uh, some useful dialogue. Uh, the second thing is the presentations will be available, as well as the videos of this uh, uh, symposium, will be available sometime next week. Uh, and Rolene from Polis will send you all out an email telling you how to access that material. The final thing is uh, you've got some cards. Sandy, could you hold up a card? So these cards were distributed. If you have questions for the final session, please go and put those cards, like write your questions down on those cards and give them to any of the people in the, uh, with the red name tags on. So our first speaker this afternoon is gonna be Stephanie Smith. She manages the hydrology department at BC Hydro. She's also the Canadian chair of the Columbia River Treaty Hydrometeorological Committee. And uh, here's Stephanie, thanks. Great. Ah, yes, good to see so many of you back from lunch. So I will try to keep this entertaining and lively, and I won't take it personally if you doze off. But <clears throat> So let's just get it started. Um, I was just saying, I, I was really excited to hear a lot of what I'm actually going to be covering this morning. Um, so we've got a, got a lot of good background. Um, so yeah, so I guess I will stick to kind of the, pulling some of the points out that, that you probably have already heard this morning particularly looking at um, some of the storage operations that are done under the Columbia River Treaty and, and how those might um, be affected, I guess, by a changing climate. So, um, so yeah, dive in here. Um, so yeah, my basic um, premise, I guess if you take nothing else away from today, um, is that climate change has the potential to, to impact um, the treaty storage operations. So. Um, so we've seen, and I'll show a little bit more on, on how the hydrology has been changing and is changing. Um, talk a little bit um, about current storage operations and some of the flexibility that we do have um, under the treaty and under some of the supplemental agreements. Um, and then a little bit on con considerations for the future. Um, so yeah, I'd like to start when I'm talking about the Columbia River Treaty, uh, or the Columbia River Basin, I guess. Um, in comparison um, to other um, heavily regulated basins like the Colorado River or the Missouri River. Um, and the difference in the Columbia is that um, we have a lot more flow than storage as opposed to say the Colorado um, where it's been heavily impacted in terms of extractions um, and they built a lot more storage than they have flow. So um, in terms of the, the plot there, so the, um, the farthest, would that be right to you? Um, is the Columbia Basin um, significantly more, more flow generally every year than we have storage to hold. Um, so it becomes a, a, a flow management um, issue as opposed to worrying about whether we're going to have enough water um, to meet the needs in the basin. Um, but under, uh, and so we've heard a little bit this morning, and I'm going to show some of the results from, from the U.S. climate change studies that are, are literally just being published right now. They're out for draft review right now. Um, this was done by the River Management Joint Operating Committee, so uh, a consortium of um, different agencies in the Pacific Northwest and the University of Washington and the University of Oregon, I believe, um, have been spent the last couple of years redoing a lot of the studies that were done uh, in sort of the late um, 2000s um, with updated climate change information um, and kind of new, new knowledge about how to do climate change scenario and, and hydrologic scenarios. So building off the lessons of the past, um, bringing those into to a new assessment of uh, what climate change looks like in, in the Pacific Northwest and particularly in the Columbia Basin. Um, under that study um, that uh, 
that the University of Washington has done um, and, and is in the report basically showing, um, so they did a study looking at 10 different global, global climate models, looking under that um, RCP 8.5 that Marcus was talking about this morning. Um, and this is a period centered on 2030. Basically all of the models are saying we're gonna have, likely to have more water in the basin on an annual basis. And that's, that's similar to what we've heard. Um, the size of the circles there, I think are actually sized to the, the, the current flow in terms of uh, their contribution in the basin. Um, so yeah, basically that's saying if we're gonna have at least the same amount of water or a bit more water, um, flood control obviously is gonna to continue to be a concern in the basin. Um, we've seen a little bit in terms of this morning about how having the reservoirs and having the, the Columbia River Treaty reshapes the flows um, for better or for worse um, with different impacts. Um, this is an, a plot of the Columbia River Birch Bank. So it's not just um, uh, the US side that benefits from flood control operations, but Birch Bank this is 2014. Um, the, the horizontal lines are basically what the, the different levels of impact uh, at different flows at the Columbia River at Birch Bank. Um, the red line is what the unregulated flows would have been. Um, and then the blue line is what the actual the regulated flows were. Um, so if, if there were no dams, basically, um, they could have reached the, the one in 200 year flood uh, at Birch Bank. Um, but with re-regulation, brought that down to basically no impact. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we do have, have the Columbia River Treaty. It allows us to kind of reshape um, the, the flow of the water. Um, the, the treaty itself is a little bit prescriptive. So this is outflows at Arrow, or I guess combined Arrow and Duncan outflows, which is one of the, the kind of things we have to report on and, and manage to. Um, so the red horizontal lines in different months um, basically shows what the treaty says should happen and with uh, a lot of coordination um, between the entities. And then with um, the different operating agreements we have and the non-treaty storage agreement, um, the reshaping is the, the dark blue lines, um, basically able to reshape water um, into uh, basically storage, storage a bit more in the winter um, and then releasing that later in the summer. And a lot of this was done to, to try to match some requirements under um, for fisheries, um, both in the US and in Canada. So trying to make a bit better use of the water. So there is some, some flexibility there um, to uh, basically to meet those non-power needs. Um, we also saw from Marcus and, and others this morning that um, so we're seeing so the annual flow might be going up a little bit, but the real story is, is how much the flows might be changing seasonally. Um, so similar sort of model um, output from the RMGOC study, looking at the different seasons there on the, on the right-hand side. Um, so starting in the winter, December, January, February, um, and March, April, May, seeing increase in flow basically across the basin. Um, and that's both a contribution of increased winter rainfall in, in the winter, um, and then the earlier freshet happening, um, what might have normally peaked in May, June, and even into July, peaking earlier with the, the snow melt combined with additional rain in, in those seasons, that's that season. And then in the, the summer months and early and all, all the way into sort of October, November, seeing this decrease in flows. So basically concentrating all of the flow in one part of the year um, and earlier than we've seen, and then leaving a very dry um, summer period to deal with. Um, so that's depicted in the hydrographs there, showing just one of the example outputs um, from the RMGOC study. They did multiple runs with multiple different techniques just to see what the difference, um, which technique you use uh, makes in, in what you're doing and, and the outcomes. Um, showing kind of the control flow, what it looks like in the 2030s, and then what it looks like in the 2070s. So there's that shift to earlier and higher winter flows. Um, and uh, that decrease in the summer. Um, and again, with all of the GCMs that they've been looking at, and they did a lot of analysis on, on how to select those GCMs, all saying, kind of pointing in the same direction. Um, so one of the key points I wanted to make today actually is, so we've looking at all these climate projections out to the 2030s and 2050s and 2070s. The reality is this is happening now. So this is 2017. And if you look at this is the flow at the Dalles, and again, we've got kind of in the background, the historic range of, of flows. Um, and then 
in the red what the unregulated flows um, would have been, and in the blue the observed flows at the Dalles. What you can see is, is the shift um, earlier in the season, so we can see um, a lot of runoff, or a lot of outflow anyway, um, in kind of the February, March um, period, kind of at a normal the peak is a little bit where, where the normal would, would be. Um, the key there, I think, too, also is that in March, the um, observed flow was actually higher than the, what the regulated or the unregulated flow would have been. Um, and that was a, a product, I believe, this year of, of changes in the water supply forecast. So a lot of the re releases are dictated by the water supply forecasts that come out in January, February, March, April, May. Um, this year was very, very dry up until the end of February, and then it started to rain and snow. And so having to respond in terms of the flood control targets um, in, during the month of March, having to re release a lot of water that year um, to make sure there was room to, to store all the, the, uh, the water during the freshet period. Um, just so, some of the um, details in that, though. Um, so by doing that regulation, basically reducing the, the flood stage of Vancouver, Washington by four to four and a half feet and keeping it into that minor flood stage. Although we also heard this morning in terms of whether 450 is where we would see minimum damage, or would it be a little bit higher than that? Um, and then the other uh, on this, basically seeing in March and early April setting new maximums, so setting that upper curve. Um, so that'll be reset from, from that year um, and become a new, new part of the record. Um, so yeah, so in terms of the Columbia River Treaty review, and I, I think now in terms of the negotiation, it was agreed quite early on, um, both in the studies the US did and the Canada did, um, that climate change needs to be taken into account. Um, we agreed, so we, we share and we review uh, the joint studies together. Um, BC Hydro, we've put a lot of input on, on the RMGOC study, um, and, and we've shared definitely the work that we're doing as well. Um, and we have agreement in terms of that there will be the same or more water available, um, particularly in the Canadian side of the basin. Um, we're agreeing that the, the timing of that runoff changes. Um, we agree there may be potential impacts for flood control. Um, the original RMJOC study went and looked at generation, in the, in, particularly in the Pacific Northwest as well, and saw lesser impact to generation due to climate change. Um, Definitely recognizing there can be potential impacts to, to fish in the basin, and I put up uh, water temperatures as a question mark. Um, we heard a little bit on the impacts of, of uh, just the warmer, warmer um, conditions and, and what that means um, for the survival in, of fish and thriving of fish. Um, and then the big story as well is, is that the snowpack storage is, is decreasing, and particularly in the U.S. We saw a little bit of that in Marcus's presentation this morning, and I'll show you the, the RMJLC results in a second. A couple of key pieces around the snowpack. One, we, like I mentioned, we use water supply forecasting to help predict how much water is going to be coming down through the freshet period and into the summer. Um, in a changing climate, that ability to, to forecast water supply is based, which is based largely on what the snowpack is um, and a lot of other science and, and hydrology. Um, but if you start to lose that winter snowpack, you lose your predictability. So you can go out and measure how much snow or you can do remote sensing and see how much snow is sitting on the hillsides. If that water is coming in as, as, as rainfall and not being stored as snow, it, it degrades the predictability of our water supply forecast models. So this is a concern for the forward, for the future in terms of not only is um, kind of the, the world becoming a bit more uncertain, but we actually have less ability to predict what's going to happen as well. So that's, that's a challenge for, for hydrologists and, and uh, for groups like mine in terms of how do you stay on top of being able to give the best information and the best um, definition of uncertainty of how much flow is coming. Um, so it's a very simplistic model of flood control, and I think Kelvin will give you a better one, um, basically. Um, over the winter, you're going to want to uh, um, draw your, your reservoir down to make room for all of the, the snow melt that might be happening later. But I guess if it's not happening, um, should you be capturing some of that, that winter runoff? Um, because it's actually what your, your snow melt would have been. Um, balancing, leaving room to, to manage these, these uh, wintertime floods 
um, and whatever spring runoff you get um, against the risk of not actually being able to refill in, in the summer. Um, so it becomes a much more complex uh, and challenging um, um, management issue of how much risk are you going to take on either side of, of this equation. Um, one of the things right now, a lot of the, the, um, the flood control targets are set on forecasts of the April through August runoff. And with changing climate, you can see in, in the plots, and I'll show you some more, um, that more of that, that runoff is shifting into March. So are we missing, are we missing part of the, the water because we actually aren't predicting the, the months that we should be? So yeah, so similar to the plots that Marcus showed this morning. So this is the RMJOC, the, U the University of Washington. So they're looking, basically it's almost exactly the same. It just has more slices in it. Um, so showing uh, kind of what the snowpack, how much snow there is in the basin um, based on the, the 1980s and then the changes over time. Uh, and similar to what Marcus said this morning, you're seeing massive changes in the US side of the basin and lesser changes in the Canadian side. Um, so in terms of a low runoff year, so it's not all flood control, flood control. Um, it's also on the other side, the, the, the low summer flows. Um, so this is an example from 2015, basically. Um, so what you can see is the, the spring runoff that year in the Canadian side of the basin was close to normal, maybe a little bit of no, below normal. But then as you go south, it gets drier and drier. And what happens under those conditions um, we go into what's called proportional draft. And so in that, and I'll try to explain this, and Kelvin can correct, correct me. <laughs> um, so in the proportional draft, what, you, what the, becomes the critical um, sort of, what they're trying to preserve is the, the ability to meet firm energy requirements. And so they proportionally draft the reservoirs that have the least energy content in them. And that tends to be Duncan, which doesn't have any generation, and Arrow, and then Mica and then some of the US um, basins. Um, and so what you end up doing in a case, in this case, because we all share, I guess, under the treaty, the collective water resource in the Columbia Basin, um, is that particularly Arrow Reservoir gets drawn down quite a bit more than everywhere else. And so there was a comment this morning about, and you'll hear it from anybody who lives around Arrow, um, that um, Lake Roosevelt is full and, and uh, the Arrow Lakes, Arrow Reservoirs is quite low. Um, and in, this was one of those years and one of the things that, uh, that really stood out to me in, in this year, um, I've highlighted the April through August period, and what you can see is large slug of water came down before that, and so that water was not captured. Uh, it was basically um, um, run out of the system and was out in the Pacific, um, and maybe should have been captured, um, given, um, I don't know what the water supply forecasts looked like earlier in that year, I haven't, haven't had a chance to look at them, but um, maybe should have been, been held back um, to be, um, they couldn't have known it was going to be so dry through, through the whole of, of the summer. But um, anyway, it's just kind of starting to look at what's happening in the early part of the season. And, and are, we, are we letting fresh hat water go when we should be storing it is a question. Um, so in this year, um, BC Hydro, we, we did what we could. So we, we negotiated in terms of trying to prop arrow levels up. Um, we released more water from Duncan to meet the downstream flows. Uh, we released more water from MICA to help bring the reservoir levels up. Um, but Arrow Reservoir did end up something, I can't remember the actual numbers, um, like 15 feet, I think, below full. And then over the course of, of um, August and September, continued to draft through that period and ended up quite low. Um, in summary, um, yeah, so basically, um, any storage operations that today, well today, but, but ideally also looking forward, both flood control and refill um, under the current and the future treaty um, really need to be adaptable to a changing climate. And this is not a climate that we're expecting in the future, it's a climate that's happening now. Uh, as I said, they're happening now. Um, uh, um, and then uh, this idea of, of under a normal year, things, things under the treaty um, really work out quite well. Um, but in very wet years or very dry years, we can see sort of dis disproportionate benefits to, um, I think, well, in my opinion, <laughs> to the U.S. in terms of um, both flood control and this firm, firm energy. So these were the, the, the tenets of the treaty. 
Um, and I think that is, again, a, a negotiating point from the Canadian side uh, of, of determining what, what uh, all of these benefits are <laughs> and inclusive of, of some of the other ones that we've heard of today. Um, and then the plot is just from 2415, showing the whole basin and kind of showing this wet, wet side on the north side in the Canadian part and, and very dry in the U.S. side. So I think that's, I'll leave it there. Stephanie, thank you. Are there any quick clarifying questions that we might have? Stephanie, we'll see you back here in 45 minutes. So the next speaker is Marvin Schaefer. Marvin or is, is got a PhD in economics. Uh, he's got a very strong background. Uh, he was the lead negotiator for the province of BC, establishing the provisions governing the return of the Canadian entitlement to the downstream benefits after the expiry of the original 30-year sale over the late 1990, early 2000 period. So this is a whole black art, and uh, we're very fortunate to have <laughs> Marvin here to explain it to us. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and I wanted to thank uh, Bruce for uh, inviting me here, and I was asked to talk about the, uh, the economics of electricity generation in the treaty area and beyond, and not uh, being certain what he wanted me to talk about, I thought I'd talk about something I wanted to talk about, <laughs> <laughs> which is what speakers are supposed to do, I think. And, and I wanted to talk about the strategic value of, of hydro resources, generally large hydro resources with storage, and, and, and the downstream benefits, uh, of course, from the, the Columbia River Treaty. And I know most of you are here today to talk about the strategic value of all of the other resources that, that uh, perhaps and, and uh, have not been taken into account in the way they should have been in the treaty. But I think as we move to the kind of proper multi-resource planning that many of you would seek, uh, it's very important to understand the strategic value of, and na the nature and, and the strategic value of all of the resources that are affected uh, by uh, reservoir operations including, of course, the power um, um, resource that would be affected by any changes in the treaty and treaty operations. Um, uh, as, uh, as you know, and we've uh, heard uh, earlier today, the, the, the treaty, um, when it was entered into in the early 1960s, provided for the development of storage reservoirs in Canada uh, Kinbasket, Arrow, and Duncan, as well as coordinated reservoir, uh, reservoir operations to optimize flood control and power generation on the Columbia River system. And, and the downstream power benefits, the downstream benefits, DSBs, were the increase in the power production that was enabled by the coordinated operation of, of these reservoirs. And, and the Canadian entitlement was Canada's share, whether it was agreed in the treaty that the downstream benefits would be shared 50-50 between Canada and the United States, and the downstream benefit, uh, the Canadian entitlement was uh, Canada's 50% uh, share. The, um, the treaty uh, provided for the return of that entitlement, the Canadian entitlement, for a period of no less than 60 years. And uh, in the first 30-year period, the, the, the Canadian entitlement was sold by Premier Bennett, uh, and it was sold for some $250 million in order to help pay for the, the, the dams and the reservoirs that were constructed in Canada. And at the time, I think this first speaker this morning pointed this out, at the time the treaty was entered into, the forecasts were such that uh, people didn't think there would be a significant amount of DSBs of incremental power production in the United States by these treaty dams and operations because of the development of the U.S. system. And so what the treaty provided for was after the initial 30-year uh, sale period, the power, uh, the Canadian entitlement would re be returned to the border at a point near Oliver, B.C. Of course, the only problem with that was there was no transmission line at Oliver, B.C., and that led to the negotiations in the late 1990s in order to figure out how does Canada get that, that entitlement back, uh, an entitlement that people didn't think would be significant at the time, 
And it reminds me of something, it's very humbling for economists to hear this, but I'm sure uh, there were economists advising Premier Bennett when he sold the, the entitlement for 30 years uh, and he got 250 million. He said, you know, you could probably sell it for three, 60 years for 300 million and the present value of that would be better than what you could expect uh, from the present value of these future diminishing DSPs. But, but he was a wily premier and he didn't do that and he didn't discount heavily future resources, especially the future resources, the value of which was uh, very uncertain. And it was a good thing for Canada, uh, at least that he didn't do that uh, because the Canadian entitlement now is very significant. It's uh, in the order of 1,250 megawatts of, of peak capacity and some uh, 4,500 gigawatt hours of energy, which is roughly, not exactly, but roughly the size of, of uh, the Site C uh, hydro project that's being developed in the province, and, uh, and it's better located. So it's, it's a valuable resource, and it's valuable not only for, for British Columbia, it's valuable for the United States, which because by virtue of it only being 50% of the DSPs means that at least the power potential from the treaty is some uh, uh, 9,000 gigawatt hours and 2,500 megawatts, a very significant, uh, uh, very significant resource. There's people here who can speak to this better than I can in terms of the uh, actual planning that goes on uh, in, in implementing the treaty provisions. But just in my economist general way, assume I know what I'm talking about here, but six years in advance, uh, the, the entities, representatives from the entities, BC Hydro and, on the Canadian side and Bonville Power and the Army Corps and the American side, get together and among other things, they develop what are called assured uh, operating plans which calculate uh, the magnitude of the DSPs. And, and what they do is they compare the, the amount of power, the amount of capacity and energy in the United States side of the system that is possible with the treaty uh, dams and, and coordinated uh, reservoir operations as compared to the counterfactual of what could have been achieved without them. And that's how they're calculated, very much consistent with the principle of optimum power production and flood control as the guiding principles. The actual uh, operating plans so are developed much closer to the event, I believe a year in advance, the detailed operating plans, and they can vary and do vary, as we just heard, from the plans, the operating plans that would provide for maximum power production because they take into account other values and other interests, including, very importantly right now, fish. And so there are releases that diminish the actual power uh, potential uh, from the treaty operations to deal with other uh, resources. And uh, I think it's important to know that because I think it's important to know that the treaty can, even in its current form, it may not be the best way, but it can in its current form actually accommodate other resource interests. And I guess the challenge is to make sure in the upcoming negotiations and all the discussions that uh, people like yourselves will be happening, uh, ha will be having and, and others uh, will be dealing with, is to ensure that the principles and the obligations of the parties are appropriate for ensuring that these detailed operating plans, the actual operating plans, do properly and fully take into account all of the resources uh, that are affected by the reservoir operations. And it provides some kind of model of where you could have a starting point under the treaty and as we currently do, move from that for these other interests and values. I want to get back now to the, the strategic value of these large hydro resources. You know, the downstream benefits are not just the production of electricity. They're not just the, the incremental, or the increase in the, the gigawatt hours of energy that are produced because of, for example, reduced spill and, and other things that enable more water to be run through the generators uh, and therefore increase the, the, the firm energy uh, capability uh, in, in the United States. Uh, they also uh, enable more power to be produced at any point in time. In other words, they, they enable the, uh, the system to provide more dependable capacity. And in terms of uh, 
this guy, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Um, in terms of energy, if, if we think of the Canadian entitlement, multiply it by two, there's a, right now something like 9,000 uh, gigawatt hours of downstream benefits, potential increase in power production enabled by the treaty. That amounts to roughly about 1,000 average megawatts. In other words, you could you have enough water to produce 1,000 megawatts every hour uh, of the day, every day of the year. Well, the, the peak capacity is increased by 2,500 uh, megawatts. In other words, two and a half times that. They enable more power to be produced in any one hour. And that increased capacity is very important and very valuable. A, a reliable um, hydro system, a, a reliable power system, uh, requires uh, dependable capacity. And of course, you need dependable capacity uh, in order to meet your peak, peak load requirements. You, uh, you need increasingly now dependable capacity to back up the, the, the kinds of resources that we're seeing coming on stream in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere, wind. Um, you know, there was a British study I just looked at, which is looking at the availability of wind resources over a, a, a certain period of time. And it, in this particular study, they looked at, well, what was the, the amount of energy that was produced over extended nine-hour periods over a, a total of a 42-hour period, or sorry, a 42-day period? And what they found was, that in a 42-day period, there was at least one nine-hour period where there was virtually no wind production. And, and so you need, you need something that's dependable, capacity that you can fill in for that kind of resource. And um, you also uh, you need dependable capacity in order to shape your energy production to when it's most needed. And we're seeing that increasingly. I want to come to that in a minute. With with uh, solar, uh, with increased solar penetration in the marketplace, when you have a very distinct pattern of oversupply at certain periods and undersupply at other periods between daytime and nighttime uh, periods. So, why is capacity? Why am I talking about capacity? Is uh, because it's increasingly important. And it's increasingly important throughout North America, but certainly on the West Coast, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one reason is that we're seeing the, 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 the phasing out of thermal power resources, in particular coal resources. In some parts of North America, we're seeing phasing out of uh, nuclear resources that provide a dependable capacity that systems need in order to have efficient, reliable supply to be able to meet peak loads. We're also seeing increased penetration of wind resources, which, as I just said, is not. It provides, you'll see uh, references to so much capacity of wind coming on stream. Well, wind produces energy. We know that. And we can be relatively confident of the amount of energy that wind will, pr will produce in any particular location, depending on the wind resource. But we can't be confident that wind will produce electricity when we might need it. And so we need dependable capacity to back up wind. And with uh, solar and the increased penetration of solar, which is really dramatic, uh, particularly we're seeing this now in California and, and, and regions like that, uh, there's also some variability in its dependability. I mean, there are some random events, cloud cover and the like. But more importantly, there is a very predictable pattern of its availability. And, and we know uh, that it will be available during the, the, day, uh, the daylight periods, and, and increasingly so as you go through the midday and early evening hours, and of course, disappear as we move through the evening and into the nighttime. And you need capacity that enables you to shape your supply of energy to match the supply of energy that's coming from from these uh, increasingly important resources, resources that we want to see more of, but that need appropriate complements for a system to efficiently and, uh, and reliably uh, be run. Uh, 
Uh, this is uh, a graph. You can ignore yesterday's net demand. It's just something that I pulled off. I think it was in March, uh, the day. The day doesn't matter because it looks like this all the time. And, and this is, although I don't see it, it's called the, the duck curve. Uh, maybe somebody can explain to me the duck that's in this duck curve. But if you look at that graph, the, the top line, that aqua green line, is the, um, the total demand on the, the queso is the, the California uh, system, uh, the California system, the independent system operator. And, and that's the, the hourly demand. And, and on the side there, you can see the megawatts, if you can read it. And uh, the, the, the dark blue line is the demands for supply of electricity, net of the solar that's provided by all the solar resource. And you can see what happens. It's just a dramatic reduction in the amount of electricity that has to be supplied during the daytime hours. And ramping up very dramatically as you move into the evening hours, I think if I, if I pull the numbers off, right, it was, it was going from something like uh, 14,000 megawatts uh, midday to uh, needing something like uh, over, what is that, 26,000, 30, almost 30,000 megawatts at the evening peak. You know, when the, when the sun goes down and everybody's home turning on their lights and, and demand is going up in any event. And um, when you have that, uh, when you have that, uh, that, kind of pattern, you need something to fill that gap. And, and what a resource like the DSBs provide, what a resource like large hydro storage provides, is that ability to shape your uh, production into the hours when it's most needed, and in fact, most valuable. Because paralleling this kind of duck curve graph, which is a net demand on the system, you know, they have a marketplace. You see the price of electricity, the competitive market price for electricity. Well, it falls to near zero. Uh, the, the energy that's produced midday uh, has virtually no value in the California system during the time when everybody's solar is working. But it becomes very valuable as you move into the evening hours when they're short of supply. And, and so if you have... Uh, the peak capacity like the DSPs and other large hydro systems have to go with your energy. You can shape your energy into the most valuable uh, time periods when it's available. And I've seen um, some forecasts of price variation in, in other jurisdictions where they're expecting large penetrations of, of solar. And they're even more dramatic than this. this. This is showing prices ranging, I think it's from zero to close to 60 dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, and, and, you know, there's even more dramatic, so there, there's, there's more dramatic variation in other jurisdictions because this is already dampened by the, the power supply that's coming from British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest to actually fill in the gaps. When you don't have that, you get even more extreme uh, price, price variation. And, and so, uh, the, the, again, the, the strategic value here is it's obviously good for the parties that can produce the electricity in the hours that's most needed. It's also important for the systems that's relying on that to fill in the gaps and to mitigate the price volatility uh, that would otherwise take place. So strategic value of DSPs, I just want to emphasize uh, when you uh, Think about it. Don't just think about it as energy and say, we can replace that energy with wind. You can't. You've got to think about the capacity it provides, the shaping capability it provides, the backup it provides, its complementarity to the kinds of resources we're seeing uh, introduced in, in systems uh, throughout Western North America and, and in fact, throughout uh, North America more generally. And it's that dependability to meet demand, it's dispatchability to back up, it's shaping capability to enhance the value and mitigate uh, price volatility. And because uh, I was asked to give a talk as an economist, I'm just going to throw out one word here, uh, as an economist, and that's the concept of opportunity cost. And opportunity cost is the value of what you're foregoing when you pursue one 
uh, resource interests or one option as opposed to something else. And, and uh, the way to find, you know, I always try to uh, advise people to, to try to find middle ground or that's increasingly impossible in this day and age. But anyway, that's what I try to do. And when you try to find middle ground, you want to understand the opportunity cost of what, what you're asking other people to give up for the interests that you think are more important. And the ways in which you can do that, in this case, the ways in which you can uh, pursue your interests that minimize the opportunity cost for other parties is very important. And to do that, in this case, you have to understand uh, the importance of not just energy, uh, which in, is really a commodity that's becoming increasingly cheap, uh, but capacity, which at least right now, without uh, much greater advances in battery and other new technology, is increasingly valuable. Okay, thank you. 34 seconds to go. How's that? <laughs> Marvin, thank you. Are there any quick questions? Thanks. Sorry, where? Let's wait for a microphone, please. Bala. Regarding the downstream benefits, uh, it's easy to understand in going from unregulated to regulated flow, and there is some additional power generation uh, south of the border. But going forward from 2024, the dams are already in place. So what will be the baseline flow from which the downstream benefits will be calculated? Is it the, still the unregulated or? If there's the no, if there's no uh, renegotiation of the terms, I would have to assume it would still be done the way it's always been done, which is to, to compare the power uh, production with the coordinated operations for optimum power production with the 3D dams in place versus a counterfactual uh, without them in place. So that's still the, the incremental value. I don't know value. what the treaty says. I mean, after yeah. the first 60 years is done, well, the dams are already in place. Nobody's going but to But they've been it. in place since they were built. They've been in place for the last 60 years. So the process, there, there's nothing magical about the 60-year date except that the parties could give notice that they wanted to terminate the provisions. That's the only thing magical about the 60-year date. But, but the benefits arise in perpetuity. The potential benefits arise in perpetuity by building the dams. What, what changes is, and, and what changes the magnitude of the DSBs and what was forecast to change the magnitude of the DSBs was the evolution of the system. And I think someone, uh, the speaker this morning was mentioning that with, uh, with more thermal development and, and more growth in the American system, the technical calculations would have found that there would have been less added value from the, from the treaty dams. Um, is it anticipated that electric cars will impact the electrical, uh, the electricity market? Uh, I think it is. And, uh, I think it, it will in, in, in a couple of very important ways. You know, one way is, is, of course, it will just increase the demand for electricity. The other is that with appropriate pricing, it can help deal with some of these problems. It's another way that you could try to deal with this shape of electricity and this problematic shape of electricity that... You know, just like we uh, talk about we need demand as well as the supply side strategies to meet our energy requirements, there can be demand as well as supply side strategies to deal with this capacity problem. So I think there'll be incentives for people to, um, to try to shift the charging of that as much as possible to when power is more plentiful. Thanks. Thank you very kindly. Our next speaker is Kelvin Ketchum. Uh, his career with BC Hydro spanned 36 years, and he's got 25 years of experience with the Reservoir Operation Group. Uh, Kelvin worked closely with his U.S. and Canadian counterparts on the Columbia River Treaty Operating Committee, 
and was the Canadian chair for this committee for 13 years. Uh, he led the Canadian team in developing the first CRT agreement to modify rep reservoir operations to benefit fisheries in both countries. So, Kelvin. Thanks for having me here. Um, I am retired, but I, I still, as a hobby, I like to go around and talk about the Columbia River Treaty to people. And so I'm hoping you don't fall asleep. I, I, I try very hard not to, uh, not, not to put people to sleep, but it is after lunch. So um, I'm gonna, some of my slides have already been covered by other people. So I'm gonna, I'll just flip through those pretty quickly. Um, You've seen this map before. It, I think it's uh, we, we've all borrowed it from the Corps of Engineers. Um, really, we have the treaty because of the 1948 flood and because there was a big need for hydroelectricity right after World War II. Um, and I think these some of these numbers have been mentioned before. I'm glad that we're all consistent with our numbers. Um, but I think one thing that I that I've heard that in the, in the biggest of flood 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 times like 1894, possibly 1948. 1961, about 50% of the water actually is coming from Canada during those big flood times. So uh, Canada has a big part to play, not only just in the average annual flow, but in, in, the, flood, in the flood periods. Uh, and I don't think anybody's mentioned the Columbia River is uh, the fourth largest river in North America. And I dare you to name the, the first three. I know number five is the Yukon, and number eight is the Fraser, but the Columbia is number four. I think the first the first three are Mississippi, Mackenzie, St. Lawrence. I don't know the order, but uh, Columbia is number four. Uh, the reason we needed the treaty was because obviously the U.S. had really run out of dam sites. You know, they they built they built Grand Coulee. They I think I think Dwarshack was on the books. They couldn't build Libby because it backed up into Canada. Canada had had some really good dam sites. So effectively, the 1948 flood electricity need. They all, they all worked into the, the treaty, and as somebody said it took uh, 16 years for the, for the treaty to be ratified. Um, I don't think this graph has been shown. This is really just the year-to-year um, the -year variability of flow on the Columbia, and this is, again, at, at the Dalles, Oregon, which is just upstream of Portland, um, and shows, shows the annual variability of runoff. Um, I think, I think this only goes up to 2,000, but it, it still is quite representative. Um, you know, it's, there, there are a few dry periods in a row. 1928 to 32 was a dry period. I think the, four, the early 40s were a dry period. And then you get a couple of wet periods all, all in a row. Um, I guess the other thing to point out, it, it's pretty hard to predict ahead of time what kind of flow you're going to get. And Stephanie mentioned this. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm very grateful to Stephanie for all the hard work she did in forecasting uh, river flows for me when I was sitting in the chair trying to make decisions on reservoirs. So um, thank you, Stephanie. You get, you get a pretty good runoff forecast once you get some snow on the ground, January 1st, February 1st, you start to get a pretty good runoff forecast. Um, there, there have been attempts to, to do it earlier with El Nino signals. Uh, I don't know that they're really successful yet, but you know they're working on it. But uh, the, the you know the really good indicator of what kind of annual volume you're going to get is this is the snow. I would say April first is, is kind of the the indicator that everybody points to, uh, and then you get a year like 2012 where we had a little bit above average snow, and then the worst rainfall ever at Castlegar in in the month of June, and it just uh, it came out of the blue. And it caused, caused flooding in Canada. And I'll show you a graph of that uh, later on. Um, you've seen pictures of the 1948 flood. And somebody mentioned, I think uh, Barbara mentioned, there was some people, some people killed in the Portland Vanport area. I think it was 50 to 60. Um, lots of flooding in Canada at the time. Uh, people who lived in Trail at the time have, have told me about the flooding in Trail. Um, I think people have talked about this. Re treaty required us to build the three reservoirs, but we didn't turn over control of those reservoirs to the U.S. Um, you know, I, I would go out to public meetings in the, uh, the Columbia Kootenai, and I, I see some of some of the folks who used to attend my public meetings. Uh, Ramona's back there, um, and, and there was this thought that you know somehow 
somebody in Portland call, calls me up and says, Kelvin, we need some more water. Can you open the taps? It's not the way it works. There's these massive optimization models that uh, people like Jeremy and, and Doug work on to say, OK, this is the optimal way to provide water for, for both countries, for flood control and power. And, th and then we sit down and we say, OK, is this the right is this the right pattern for fish on both sides of the border too? And we do modify these flows. As long as both sides agree, we modify the flows for fish. So that, that's a long process. It's not, uh, it's not just the Americans saying, it's time for more water, please. Um, and then this treaty did permit the US to build, to build Libby, Libby, which floods into Canada. Um, I don't know if you've seen this map. I borrowed this one from the Columbia Basin Trust. And it's, it shows the, uh, the three Canadian dams and then Libby right at, right at the bottom on the, uh, in Montana. So I want to talk firstly about Col uh, Columbia Treaty flood control provisions up until 2024. There's, there's kind of two aspects to this. The power provisions of the treaty, as, as Marvin mentioned, they continue forever until, until somebody gives 10 years notice. So the, the power side of the treaty, that's the... Uh, you know, the AOP and the DOP and, and the downstream benefits, they continue basically un until 10 years notice is, is, is given. They, they were, um, and 10 years notice couldn't be given, at least they couldn't be terminated until 2024. So now it's 2018, those things really can't be terminated until, until 2028. And, they, and it still has to wait for one country to give notice. The flood control, the primary flood flood control provisions, which we're living under right now, they do terminate in 2024. And no matter, no matter, you know, and, and unless we have another agreement. So I'm going to talk about those first and then what happens after 2024. So uh, they pre-bought um, 8.45 million acre feet, which is only about 60% of the total treaty storage. But they, they pre-bought some storage, basically the right to, to uh, make sure our reservoirs were drafted, were, were, were very low in April, ready to accept all the spring runoff that happens in May, June, and July. So that's essentially what, what they bought. We call that the primary flood control, and I've got a, a picture later on. Um, they paid us some money, and as far as I know, it was, it was a fair amount of money that was paid. I uh, looked at the expected value of US flood damages avoided. We, we got half of that, and that was $64 million, you know, in 1964 dollars. They also received the right to this on-call flood control storage, um, essentially to augment uh, their primary storage. And it's, ever, it's actually never been used. Um, th there's been a couple of years where we thought maybe the U.S. is going to make that call for on-call storage, and they never have. Um, so because it's never been used, it's never been tested, we've actually never gone through the process. But what it means is they, 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 they could ask for us to, draw, to draft other storage in Canada and, 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 and reservoirs below the, 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 the normal flood control curves. So for example, we think they could ask us to, to draft Revelstoke, or, which isn't a treaty dam, or say Wachan, which isn't a treaty dam, uh, do something with Kootenai Lake, which is not a treaty dam. So we think that that's what they could ask us to do, but it's never been tested. We've, you know, we've talked about it a bit here and there, but on-call storage has, has never, been, never been tested. The other point on this slide is that under the treaty, the U.S. Army, uh, Army Corps of Engineers are the ones who craft the Columbia Treaty Flood Control Plan. Uh, we all call it the red book because that's essentially the, the color of the, the cover. But they, they craft, and it's on, it's on the web if anybody wants to look at it. They craft it with consultation with Canada. Uh, you know, I guess in hindsight, we'd prefer it to be a joint document. But in fact, it's a Corps of Engineers document. And they write it, and they consult with Canada. So that's, that's, that's actually how, how it works. They, they, they listen. But they, they all, you know, there are times when I would prefer that I, I get the pen, not, not them. But the way it is, they, they, have, the, they have the final say. And, and in the treaty, it does talk about the Corps of Engineers being the overall 
um, manager of flood control, you know what they, they do, they certainly take into account our needs at Trail and other, and other Canadian places, but when it comes to the flood control plan, they're, they're the authors. Um, Stephanie showed one of the, the flood control curves. This is a little bit more detailed. It just shows an example of what, what a flood control curve looks like. This one is for Libby Reservoir. Um, you can see the, the first three months, October to December, it's fixed. This is a, an upper bound on what, where the reservoir, it cannot go above that, that upper bound. The upper bound is fixed from October through December. From then on, it all depends on the runoff forecast. And you can see it's, it's really January 1st that it starts to deviate. If we have a low runoff forecast, and for Libby that might say three, you know, 3.5 million acre feet of, of, of runoff. If we have a low forecast, then the reservoir is allowed to, to rise. You don't need much space to, to regulate a flood because there's not much snow. But you get down to, a, say, a 7.5 forecast, the reservoir has to be drawn empty, basically. So that's, that's the way the, the flood control curves work. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the optimal way, but it, it's a very visible way for everybody to see what's going on. And there's something to be said for, for visibility. You know, this can be put up on the web. Everybody knows where it is, and so nobody's surprised. Um, so that's, that's the, way, the way it works. Once, once you get to the end of April, then it's a day-by-day -day thing. So it, this, this thing only goes from October through April. In May, June, July, it's a day-by-day -day thing. And the Corps of Engineers is continually doing um, runs of their flood control models. We're doing the same. We're trading, uh, trading information all the time. So general principles, and I think I've talked about um, this. Basically, flood control has the highest priority of anything in, in, in the treaty, except possibly drinking water. Um, that, that's how I, I always viewed it, is flood control, you know, it, uh, it, it can cause a non-optimal power operation. It can get in the way of, of fisheries operations or recreation or other things. Um, but it, it is the most important thing in the treaty, uh, other than, say, domestic water supply. Um, and, and the flood control curves, they're calibrated to, to not only look after the entire system, say, down at Portland, or Tri-Cities Washington, they're calibrated to look after the local stuff. So a Duncan Reservoir just downstream is a, is a really small community of Meadow Creek, but the Duncan flood control curves are, are, and, and the rules are calibrated to do that. The ones at Micah and Arrow are really looking after certainly Revelstoke, Castlegar Trail and everything downstream, um, but, but they, they really are looking after both local and, and system-wide flood control. So I guess the other point here is that these flood control, flood control space really can't be traded off between reservoirs. Um, there are times we'd love to have more space at Arrow, have, have the Arrow flood control curves higher and say lower at MICA, because we're a lot of times we're drafting MICA well below the flood control curve anyway. So why not just uh, do that and put the, put the uh, let Arrow be higher? But Arrow doesn't provide the same protection for downstream as MICA does because it's, Arrow is much closer to Portland than, than MICA is. So, so there's reasons why, why those curves are the way they are. Um, additional principles of flood control. Um, so nor normally, as I said, for MICA and Duncan, the, the power operation drafts those reservoirs below the flood con control curves anyways. The curves are still there in case we have an inclination to, to try to get above them, but uh, they don't do a whole lot, usually. But for, for Arrow and Libby, I would say the reservoir operation typically is pretty close up to those flood control curves. And that's after you look after power and, and the fisheries agreements and everything else. So many times for Arrow and Libby, the flood control curves are constraining what's going on. Okay, I think I've talked about the rest of this stuff. Um, this is just, just a graph to show how, how the peak flows at trail have, have reduced over, over time. And you can see where the treaty dams went in, uh, so kind of 68 to 73. 
the peak flows at trail are, are generally much lower since then, and that's, 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 that's the flood control operation happening. Um, this is an example from 1997, which was kind of our, our, our worst, our, our highest flows until we hit 2012. So I just, I just wanted to show you this. The, the, the red curve is the natural hydrograph. The blue curve is what actually happened. And you can see that, that we kept, because of the upstream dams, the, the flow at trail was, was actually held below the even localized flood damage in, in 1997. Um, 2012 was, was the, the year that really tested things. And I think we had the highest flows at trail in 2012 uh, since the dams had been put in place. This is a similar graph to Stephanie's, except hers was for a different year. So 2012, 1961 is the green line, and that's pretty similar to 48. So yeah, 48, 61 were the pre-dam big flow years. The red line is what would have happened in 2012 without the dams, and the blue line is what actually happened. We actually got to a, to a, a damaging flow at, uh, say, Janelle and Trail and Castlegar. There's certainly some parks underwater and Trail, and uh, it, it, was, it was quite a, a, an interesting time. Uh, Nelson had, had some minor, minor-ish flood damage. I mean, nothing's minor if you're getting flooded yourself. But it was, it, it was serious, but it wasn't um, major flooding. Um, these are some, some of the benefits that we've seen at, that we have seen at Kootenai Lake. That just look at the top uh, blue line, up until you know 1974. That was pre dams. Since 74, that's post dams. So I think the level at Kootenai Lake has been brought down by five or six feet on average. The peak level at Kootenai Lake, and this is what happened in 2012, where the green line, I think it's green, green line is what would have happened in 2012. That would have caused significant damage at Nelson, Caslow, Creston. The red line is what actually happened. We did have you know, some damage, but as I said, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, major, major. Um, the on-call flood control storage, I've mentioned that before. And uh, as I said, the US has never called on it. Um, they have to pay us a certain amount per, per usage, but it's pretty small relative to the, the damage. But for whatever reason, they, ha they have not yet called on it. I, I guess they felt they, they, they had enough. They didn't, they didn't need to, uh, to get into it. Because of that, this has never been tested. 2024, as you know, is an important date for flood control. Um, and the, I think this has been talked about before. But if the treaty is terminated, we lose the entitlement. We'll probably, if nothing else changes, we'll probably want to operate arrow higher. If the flood control curves are gone after, you know, the primary flood control curves are gone after 2024, we're probably going to want to operate arrow higher. It's just, it just makes sense, probably from a fisheries, from a recreation, from a power generation point of view. Um, we probably don't need all of the empty space at arrow for Canadian flood control. I would say that. Uh, most of what we do there at Aero for flood control is for the system, it's for downstream. Um, but I guess the, the problem is that we've got this called upon thing that happens after 2024. When, if the US can't, can't keep their flows below, and we, we're still talking about what flow that is at, at Portland, then they, they can call us, and we have to then draft arrow or draft our reservoirs lower to be able to help them out. And that's just that's part of the, the treaty that, all, that exists. They have to pay us all of our costs, but um, it could result in a very um, unknown operation at arrow. We might be operating arrow nice and high, and all of a sudden we have to draft it quite, quite heavily. So there's, there's that aspect that is, is probably not the best thing for either country. And as I said, the treaty doesn't really talk about details there. So um, some, more, some more information on the, the post-2024. There's a couple of things where we, you know, we, we've talked a little bit with them, one, and we have some disagreements. One is what flow can they call us? It's either 450 or 600,000 uh, CFS. And then the other one is how how the treaty talks about them using all of their reservoirs or all effective storage. We would argue as Canada, that means every single reservoir in the entire US system, including all the little irrigation reservoirs on the Snake, 
the Snake River. They would say it's only the three or four big ones that are designated for flood control that have flood control as a primary purpose. There's, we haven't come to an agreement on that. So, um, and I, I've got uh, not much time left, so I'm gonna just talk about two other things. Non-treaty storage, when we built MICA, we built it bigger than it needed to be for the treaty. It's generally operated in a way that helps flood control, but it's not, it's not specifically operated for that reason. And the other one is uh, Kootenai Lake and Groma Narrows. That was the project that I was uh, kind of working on at the end. I think it's still a useful thing. It's been put on the, on the shelf for now, but that's, um, that, that would help the Kootenai Lake levels. And I'm done, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late. Do I have any quick questions? Nope, good. And the order, order of uh, saving time, the next speaker is Kim Hyatt, and given that he's been here before, he needs no further introduction. So I'm giving this talk on behalf of uh, Stephen Smith, Keith Cutchins, Casey Baldwin, Richard Vesanich, and Connor Georgi from the Upper Columbia United Tribes, Colville Confederated Tribes, Okanagan Nation Alliance, and the Spokane Tribe. I'm just the mouthpiece for uh, work that these folks have done. Uh, they presented uh, an amalgam of work at the Lake Roosevelt uh, Forum uh, a few weeks back. Uh, were unable because of the Memorial Day holiday in the U.S. to attend today, and so um, asked if I would uh, put together some information for this talk. So construction of Grand Coulee Dam completed in 1942 and at 167 meters in height obviously created an impassable barrier to any migration by dozens of anadromous salmon populations to extensive areas of the Upper Columbia in both the U.S. and Canada. The significance of this was, of course, elimination of access by salmon to the vast area of the Upper Columbia, which ensured the continued decline of salmon production that had already begun by the early 1900s due to overfishing and widespread habitat degradation. Subsequent construction of additional dams to aid navigation and hydropower development ensued. For example, the Dulles Dam construction between 1952 and 57 eliminated one of the great fishing sites of indigenous peoples on the mid-Columbia at Salilo Falls. Since time immemorial, the water, salmon, and native people of the Columbia River have been tied closely together, and damming of the Columbia River main stem for hydroelectric power and of tributaries and many sub-basins for irrigation to support agriculture have posed serious ongoing threats to salmon-based native culture in the ensuing decades as Chief Christian so eloquently addressed this morning. Canadian First Nations and U.S. tribes have been conducting joint work since the early 1970s on salmon restoration. In 2006, three Canadian First Nations hosted a workshop on salmon restoration in the Upper Columbia, and out of that grew the development of a passage paper published in 2015 by 15 tribes and First Nations which was the first, uh, I think, significant um, article that focused on the issue of restoring salmon from a First Nations and tribal view to the Upper Columbia. Recently, the Upper Columbia tribes, Yukut, and the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reserva Reservation and Spokane tribes have implemented feasibility work with Columbia Basin Fish and Wildlife Program funding. And the analysis by this, these groups has focused on identification of donor stocks, the assessment of habitat potential, life cycle modeling, and ecological risk assessment, all focused on trying to determine what the feasibility of reintroduction of stocks to the Upper Columbia might entail. Obviously, the identification of donor stocks is a precondition for pursuing any habitat and risk assessment work. And a variety of populations of salmon of a number of species have been examined for 
life history characteristics that would be conducive to reintroduction, successful reintroduction, to the upper Columbia. And three groups of fish have been identified as warranting further work. Summerfall Chinook uh, from Chief Joseph Hatchery and the Priest Rapids Hatchery appear to be good candidates. Spring Chinook from the Chief Joseph Hatchery or Leavenworth National Hatchery also appear to be good material. And of course, sockeye can be potentially reconstituted by reanadromizing Lake Roosevelt Kokanee, although one doesn't know exactly what the success of that would be, or alternately using wild origin sockeye from the Okanagan River or Lake Wenatchee, where these stocks still return to the mid-Columbia reaches successfully and sustain populations. Having identified donor stocks that appear to have some potential for reintroduction, habitat capacity assessments have been the next item of concern. And a variety of analytical tools, GIS-based mapping of intrinsic habitat potential, ecosystem diagnostic tools, and life stage uh, and life cycle models have been used to assess potential salmon production associated with major categories of habitat in the upper Columbia, that is large river segments, smaller tributaries, and associated lakes and reservoirs for their spawning or rearing potential. Ecosystem diagnostics and treatment tools rely on a triumvirate of information, starting with species knowledge, timing, location, and movement, and the way those species use habitat and how they interact with it. And then finally, broad-based information on habitat inventory to say how much of it is there, and if you run life cycle models, how well will it be used, conditioned by professional judgment, all of which goes into assessing the overall potential of habitat to support reintroduced salmon in the upper Columbia. Model analysis has also depended on more detailed Hydrodynamic models where depth, velocity, substrate, and channel bed slope have been used to extrapolate habitat area and spawner capacity in large main stem segments for species like Chinook that rely on those habitats for spawning in order to determine promising areas where these species could be reestablished, such as in stretches of uh, Lake Rufus Woods. There's a paper by Hanrahan et al. that uh, conducted this modeling. Use of habitat suitability indices in models along with expert opinion has provided first cut results regarding the potential of accessible habitat for salmon in watersheds immediately upstream of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee. So the work has focused first on those areas that are uh, closest to the high head dams that have initially excluded anadromous salmon from the upper Columbia. As you can see here, this is a type map for an adermus steelhead that suggests high habitat potential is concentrated in the watersheds around Spokane with lesser amounts in the upper Columbia or the San Poyo watersheds. Broad-based application of ecosystem diagnostic tools to assess adult salmon capacity throughout the San Poyo, the upper Columbia, and the Spokane immediately upstream of Grand Coulee Dam has yielded estimates that there's suitable habitat to support upwards of 1,200 spring Chinook, 12,000 summer fall Chinook, or 4,000 and change steelhead for a total of around 17,500 sustainable adult anadromous salmon in this area. But in 2018, juvenile and adult salmon passage at high head dams remains as the principal challenge to salmon reintroduction success. There's no sense in identifying the capacity of habitats if you can't get the fish down over these high head dams and back over them successfully. What the tribes have turned to here to assess feasibility is life cycle modeling associated with reintroduction, where the role of the models is to evaluate potential outcomes of reintroduction scenarios and strategies, to try and identify the key uncertainties and research needs or facility needs and performance to support reintroductions, 
and to provide data, in this case, for a phase one report that's due in early summer to the Columbia Basin Fish and Wildlife Program. The spreadsheet sheep model that has been used is a full life cycle model that runs on Excel. It uses Beverton and Holt dynamics, which incorporates stage specific survival but accounts for density dependence at each freshwater life stage from adults to eggs in the gravel, from eggs in the gravel to fry, from rearing fry to smolts, and then ultimately from migrating smolts back to adult returns. And this model is used to examine baseline scenarios at single or multiple dams. A lot of scenarios have been run to assess what the feasibility might be. And a typical scenario runs something like this. You trap and truck a thousand adults of either natural or hatchery origin and release them above Chief Joseph or Grand Coulee. A year or so later, you use floating surface collectors to aggregate naturally produced or alternately hatchery origin smolts in order to collect them to get them over high head dams. Now, this is more than just kind of uh, musing about what might be. There's a facility in the inset here at Baker Lake, which is a high head dam in Washington state, that gathers smolts each year to get them over that high head dam, and that truck and transports adults back over the high head dam to, in fact, an artificial spawning beach that they constructed uh, more than 30 years ago. And this project has been reasonably successful. The other thing that's pointed out is that these floating surface collectors are absolutely essential to the feasibility of any reintroduction, uh, successful reintroduction to anadromous salmon uh, above the Columbia, above Grand Coulee. Model applications depend on observations from other locations for a variety of estimates salmon survival during reservoir rearing above and or passage at high head dams, collection efficiency and survival of smolts obtained at the high head dams, smolt survival during their subsequent volitional migration through the nine run of river dams on the lower Columbia that have bypass facilities as well as penstocks, adult passage success and survival during the long return home, and then finally, adult collection efficiency via trapping and survival during trucking at Chief Joseph or Grand Coulee as impassable dams. These same considerations would apply to all of the other high head and impassable dams in Canadian portions of the Upper Columbia. So what are the conclusions from all of this feasibility work? Well, the first is that reintroductions are feasible given advanced technology. And that advanced technology has to include smolt collectors. It also requires labor intensive adult trap and truck operations. Or alternately, there are these fish cannons, uh, affectionately named whoosh, which suck fish up and blast them over high head dams, apparently successfully, although the trials on that, uh, the results of those are not, uh, not totally understood by me yet. The sustainability of naturalized or hatchery-based populations returning to the Upper Columbia will require harvest agreements with groups in the Lower Columbia. Because during the feasibility, if you use the current harvest process rules that are at uh, play in the Lower Columbia, then too few adults actually return to the terminal locations to make many of these reintroductions sustainable. I smell negotiations coming up on the Columbia, in addition to the CRT ones. What are the other conclusions? Well, there are also major knowledge gaps that remain, including the ecological impacts of altered ecosystems on the future success of reintroductions. In 1942, at the time, anadromous salmon were excluded from the upper Columbia. There were not populations or major populations of exotic species like northern pike or bass, both known to be relatively voracious predators of salmon juveniles. And so there is a question of how well reintroductions would do facing these kinds of new threats. The second major consideration that I myself have been involved in on the Okanagan is examining the ecological impacts of anadromous salmon on resident fish and ecosystems given accommodation by the latter 
to the total loss of anadromous fish after a particular period of time. Nature abhors a vacuum, and when you change things, ecosystems and resident populations of fish change in response to those changed conditions. And so there are issues, if you reintroduce anadromous fish into the upper Columbia, about what it would do to the stability or the yields or the opportunities that are currently focused on many resident fish populations throughout lakes and reservoirs there. In the Okanagan, we've had very spirited discussions with the province over exactly these kinds of issues. That is, what ecosystem are you managing for and what values are paramount in those ecosystems? Some final thoughts. Lessons from collaborative work in Canada involving the successful restoration of seriously depleted wild origin sockeye in the Okanagan, experimental introduction and of extirpated sockeye salmon to Skaha Lake and our ongoing efforts to reestablish a self-sustaining fall Chinook population are likely highly relevant to several questions about the feasibility, ecological impacts, and costs of projects contemplated in the future for the Upper Columbia, which means that tribal groups in the U.S. and First Nations in Canada have many reasons and many resources uh, that should allow them to get together and do more successful work in the future. Thank you, and there's five minutes and seven seconds for questions. Are there any questions for Kim before we bring all our panelists up? Why don't you all come up and we'll uh, See what else we can do. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> we stun them. <laughs> Mixed group. Keldon, I've got a question that you uh, you touched upon briefly. Uh, how different would we operate the Canadian reservoirs if we didn't have to provide flood protection to the United States? So if we didn't have the primary flood, flood control and if we didn't have those yep. flood control curves, the power operation would still draft reservoirs but my guess, and I, th I think the studies show this, is we would tend to keep arrow a bit higher, probably taking that water out of, I'm not sure, Micah, Duncan, but we'd probably want to keep arrow a bit higher because there's power generation benefits for us. It's generally good for recreation, probably for, for fish as well. So uh, the, the problem is post 2024, there's that called upon provision, which when the U.S. needs it and they demonstrate they need it, we have to quickly draw arrow down. So, okay. so if we use that scenario, how much would we impair flood protection in the United States? It's a good question. I, I, I mean, basically, they would have to use all of their reservoirs first. So that's going to be painful for them. I mean, they'd, they'd have to have at least plan to draw Cooley, Dorshak, Libby down. It's, it's also painful for us at Libby because Libby backs up into Canada, so that's Lake Kukanusa. So that's not good for you know the Canadian half of the reservoir either. So, but it would certainly be painful for the U.S. and especially if if they had to draft all of their irrigation reservoirs on the Snake. That that's very risky, you know, because what happens if you don't get that that runoff? And then the, the, res, the irrigation reservoirs are left empty and not, not enough, enough water. So, so they could probably still provide similar flood protection, but all of, the, all of the pain would be on them, or most of the pain would be on the U.S., less on us. And I guess the related question would be, how well do we understand the flood risks in the United States? So, for example, it's my understanding that the Corps of Engineers has undertaken a very substantial hydro hydrologic and hydraulic model studies to look at uh, 
flood inundation risks, uh, and none of that is in the public domain. Do we as sort of Canadian negotiators have any understanding of what those US risks might really be? So I don't, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, Stephanie did mention, I think the 550, or somebody mentioned the, the, did, yeah. the, five, the 550. Um, the, the two places that we know is the big issue are Portland, Vancouver, you know, right across the, yep. the river, and then Tri-Cities, you know, Richland, Kennewick, Pas Pasco at the mouth of the Snake River. Those are the two big places. I, I, I have to admit, I don't know. Uh, there, there might be others in, in this room who, who do, but as far as I know, those are Corps of Engineers studies, and they're kind of keeping them close to their vest right now. Okay, and the, my final question is on Libby. How much flood protection does Libby provide to Canada? It's a big deal for Canada. And, and that's why there's a, there's a big, big question around Libby coordination. And we've, we've had this issue for 20 years on, on Libby. You know, the treaty talks about Libby in a different way than it talks about Micah Arrow Duncan. It says it has to be coordinated with Canada. A coordination could mean, could mean as simple as them calling us up and telling us, telling us what they're going to do versus full power and flood control coordination. We've, we've had all sorts of discussions with the Americans on, on Libby, and you know they have backed off discharging from Libby when it looks like Kootenai Lake is gonna flood. And, and we, we've at least sort of come up with, with that, but I, it's, it's, not, it's not quite the coordination that Canada would like. <laughs> so. Thank you. Any more questions? Could we get a microphone for John, please? So I asked Marvin a, qu a question. Um, looking forward over to the next 50 years or so, uh, there could be a significant shift towards um, distributed power, um, major installations of solar and wind, and um, a less reliance on large-scale hydro projects. So. How do you see the downstream benefits being calculated 30 to 50 years from now compared to what they are today? Well, I think they're two different questions. Uh, well, in terms of the calculation, uh, I'm not sure what the, the physical power production capability would be in, in the United States with the coordinated uh, reservoir operations versus some counterfactual without them. But in terms of the role of hydro, uh, I don't see the distributed generation diminishing the value of hydro. Uh, in fact, I, I see them as enhancing the value of hydro because, as I pointed out, they, they create the need to fill in the valleys and, and the lack of dependability of many of these resources. In other words, that you can't always count on them in the hours that you actually need the, the resource. The competition for hydro are other sources of capacity. And maybe that'll be some uh, new battery capabilities that, that don't exist today, uh, at least don't exist in, 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 the, in the manner that they're needed uh, with, with the performance and the cost capability, you know, the, the performance capabilities and costs that make them feasible. But not the distributed generation like solar. That just increases the value of a resource like hydro and increases the importance of the downstream benefits to both sides of the border. Another question over here. Jim, why don't you go ahead? Is this, okay, yeah, so uh, I guess a two-part question. I think under the treaty, I recollect that Libby Dam was allowed to be constructed and each party would take its benefits as the cards fell on the table, basically. I, was recently at a symposium in Western Montana, and a lot of folks from Montana are raising the question, you know, there's a lot of benefits flowing downstream to Canada. We provide flood protection, and there's actually downstream benefits through a whole series of dams that they built after we built Libby. Uh, has Canada made an assessment of what the avoided damages are for flooding that's prevented by Libby, and a calculation on what the downstream benefit increment is? Uh, I guess on the flooding side, I can tell you that the Kootenai Lake peaks are about six feet, five to eight feet lower on average 
Now that's a combination of Duncan and Libby. Probably three quarters of that is Libby. Um, on the power side, certainly we built Kootenai Canal to take advantage of Libby and Duncan regulation. So we clearly get lots of benefits. I don't know what the numbers are. And I just want to clarify something I said earlier about you know, Libby coordination. We, we, uh, the, U the Corps of Engineers coordinated in a, in a big way with us in 2012. We were very happy with everything they did with us in 2012. In fact, my counterpart, Jim Barden, went up to a public meeting in, in Nelson and got a standing ovation from the people up there. So, so there has been very good cooperation. But just that definition of Libby coordination is, it's different in Canada and the US, so. Thanks. Uh, yes, um, uh, one question, I've got a couple of questions, I guess. And one of them is, are we still, are we getting paid for power benefits like today for, for, the, for the downstream benefits? Uh, are we getting paid power benefits? I've, I've heard a lot about it in the past, but is it still happening? Yes, so as of what? 2003, we, we started getting megawatts every every day. Um, and in fact, sometimes BC Hydro uses them to keep the lights on. Most of the time we sell them to uh, people in the US or Alberta for the, for the maximum okay. dollars yeah, and it goes right back to the BC government. Good, good. The, the, the difference uh, after the first 30 year sale is we don't receive the entitlement in a form of dollars, which happen to be a lump sum for the first 30 years. We actually receive uh, the entitlement to a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of peak capacity that, that uh, PowerX manages on behalf of the province. Good. Thank you. Any more questions? So microphone in the back, please. The, uh, the value of the downstream electricity is strongly dependent on when it's delivered both seasonally and daily. Uh, earlier, there was a comment made that uh, the, uh, the forecast of the downstream benefits is first made six years before the year in question, and then is remade a year in advance. Just exactly how is the timing of the delivery decided on? Uh, well, yeah, OK. Um, my understanding, and I'm going to let uh, Kevin correct me, the, the, the downstream benefits are calculated six years in advance, period. The actual benefits depend on the detailed operating plans. In other words, there is a difference between the, uh, um, the increase in power that is enabled by coordinated operations for maximum power generation and the actual operations, which can vary for reasons of fish or, or, or other interests. So I just want to make that clear that um, it, they're calculated six years in advance, period. And, and as far as the timing goes, my understanding is they're calculated on a monthly basis. But Yes, yeah, so down, downstream benefits have a, a constant monthly amount of energy and a capacity. And uh, some folks in Vancouver every day will talk to their counterparts in the U.S. and say, for tomorrow we want 1,200 megawatts in hours six to nine nothing the rest of the day, but it has to add up over the month. Right. And then, and then talking to some uh, PowerX traders, people who deal with this every day, I mean, they basically told me, just look at your duck curve, and you can, and the Americans can look at that duck curve, and they know when we want that power, because we're going to deliver that to meet that, that uh, gap in supply that, that starts to emerge in the early evening hours in California, typically. It's not to say that it can't be returned to British Columbia. It can be and will be uh, when it's needed in British Columbia, but that's where it's, uh, that's how it's used now. I think we should stop here, uh, have a little bit of a break. So in the general organization of today, we had some introductory talks which were along the idea of what are we talking about. Uh, we then had some technical talks which were along the ideas of so what, why is this important? And the third part, the, the final session this afternoon, will be along the idea of now what. Uh, we have some uh, representatives from various First Nations and governments dealing with Indigenous folks and they're going to prevent, present some, uh, some information on that.
but what we're really trying to encourage is about an hour to an hour and a half discussion of where do we go from here, what's next. So I cordially invite you or suggest that you come back for that. Uh, I'd also like to again remind you that there will be tickets available for the social soiree at the university club. They'll be available right now at the desk. Eileen, would you wave? So Eileen's got a limited number of tickets. Uh, please go, if you're interested in coming, and I would encourage you to come, please see her. That'll be from 5.30 to 7.30 tonight. There's lots of food. Uh, again, thanks to the generosity of Kim. So please come back in 15 minutes, and uh, thank you. <laughs>